welcome to this short series on the five devotional writers from the 14th century which together have come to be known as the English mystics. My name is Emma Pennington and I'm a canon here at Canterbury Cathedral. In the following five videos, one devoted to each writer, I invite you to explore with me these remarkable people who they were, what they wrote, and how over six centuries later they still speak to us today. We've moved somewhat south today from Yorkshire to the great medieval diocese of Lincoln and the prestigious Augustinian Priory of Thurgerton to explore the life and writings of one of its canons, Walter Hilton. Unlike the heady, emotional spirituality of Richard Roll, Hilton presents us with one of the most complete spiritual programmes for the soul's journey to the New Jerusalem that we find in the medieval period. He's deeply orthodox and grounded in scripture. His is the reasoned road to knowing and loving God in this life which was to be a stable boat on which to launch out on the choppy waters of life. We know relatively little about Hilton, the person and the priest. It's thought he graduated from Cambridge and had at some point in his life lived as a hermit. He became a canon of the Augustinian Priory at Thurgerton and it was here that he died in 1396. Founded in the early 12th century, the Priory at Thurgerton consisted of a group of priests who lived under the religious rule of St Augustine. They thereby combined monastic contemplative life with the pastoral work of a priest, hearing confession, administering the sacraments and being around a parish. We see this combination reflected in his approach and understanding of the contemplative life. Like Roll, Hilton was asked to write about prayer and the spiritual life by other people. A number of his epistles remain but it's his work on the solitary life, written, as he says, for a spiritual sister in Jesus Christ that endures and was most popular in its day and beyond. The scale or ladder of perfection, as it has come to be known, is addressed to a recently enclosed anchoress. Hilton wants her to fulfil her vocation as a contemplative and to know something of that life which he says consists of perfect love and charity inwardly experienced through the spiritual virtues and in a true knowledge and perception of God and spiritual things. For Hilton, God is not shrouded in mystery, but fully revealed in Jesus Christ. And it's to him that she should direct her intentions and purpose. As he says, desiring to seek, feel or find nothing except the grace and presence of Jesus. It's in him that she will find what he says, the light of understanding, love and delight. But there's a long way to go before she can, as he says, live in great peace of body and soul in fellowship with God. Like a wise spiritual director, Hilton sets out the steps towards contemplation. First prayer, 
then meditation, both of which will help her to be ready to receive God's grace. Then he warns of the difficulties she will encounter, the temptations and the struggles she will have to endure. As a good priest, he follows the catechetical and pastoral teaching of the church to help her overcome the power of sin and receive the ointment of penance to heal the wounds left by sin. Hilton does not skirt over this, but much like John of the Cross afterwards, he is fully aware that the road or ladder of virtue is an arduous one, which demands both bodily toil and spiritual effort. In the last chapter of the first book, Hilton reveals that he has written as much for himself to spur himself on the road to contem contemplation as he has for anyone else. But the anchoress has had her soul stirred by love and she's not wholly satisfied with Hilton's pastoral path of self-reformation. So he writes book two and it's here we find his more arresting and what we have come to understand as mystical writing. Central to the second part is the question of how a soul can be restored to the likeness of Christ in this life. After looking to the work of Christ in redemption, Hilton explains how the Christian life is one of reforming, which is partial on earth, but made complete in heaven. This process of reforming is twofold and described in terms of reforming by faith alone and by faith and experience. Baptism constitutes the first reformation in faith by cleansing original sin and for all subsequent sins there is of course the sacrament of penance. But reformation in faith and feeling, he says, comes only to souls who reach a state of perfection through great grace and by prolonged spiritual effort. But it must first be healed of its spiritual sickness. Only, as he says, by new feelings of burning love and spiritual light which have been infused by grace, will, as he writes, the bitter passion, bodily desires and unregenerative feelings be burnt out of the heart by the fire of desire. What Hilton means by this word desire, we hear in chapter 24 as he now explains. If you wish to learn the nature of this desire, it is in fact Jesus himself. He implants this desire within you and is himself both the desire and the object of your desire. If you could only understand this, you would see that Jesus is everything and Jesus does everything. You yourself do nothing you simply allow him to work within your soul, accepting sincerely and gladly whatever he deigns to do in you. For although you possess the power of reason, you are nothing but an instrument in his hand. Therefore, when your mind is touched by his grace, and you feel yourself moved by a strong desire to please and love Jesus, you can be sure that Jesus is within you for it is he whom you desire. Fix your eyes on him, for he does not come in bodily form, but invisibly, 
with the hidden presence of his power. See him spiritually if you can. Trust him and follow him wherever he goes. For he will guide you on the right road to Jerusalem, which is the vision of peace in contemplation. For this was the prophet's prayer to his Father in heaven. Father in heaven, send out your light and your truth, that is, your Son Jesus. And he will lead me by desire to your holy hill and to your dwelling, that is, to the experience of perfect love and to the height of contemplation. So the soul advances step by step on her road to perfection. But as she is drawn to the true light of Christ, she comes to experience what he calls a night through the complete withdrawal of the soul from earthly things by an intense desire to love, see and know Jesus and the things of the Spirit. Much like St John of the Cross's later dark night of the soul, so Hilton's is a, as he describes it, a night pregnant with good, a glowing darkness, for it shuts out the false love of this world and ushers in the dawn of the true day of love of Jesus. The final chapters extol the virtues of humility and love, which finally bring her to that state of perfection where God indwells in her, revealing deep spiritual truths as well as pouring indescribable light and love into the loving, attentive soul. Hilton aptly ends this journey with these words. One who wishes to hear these sweet spiritual murmurs of God must possess great purity of soul meekness and all other virtues, and be partly deaf to the clamour of this world. This is the voice of God of which David said, The voice of God prepares the hearts, and he will show them the thickets. That is, the inspiration of God makes souls as light as hearts that spring up from the ground and leap over the bushes and briars of worldly vanity. And he shows them the thickets, that is, his secrets, which can be discerned only by sharp eyes. This contemplation, surely founded in grace and humility, makes a soul wise and fires it with a longing to see the face of God. These are the spiritual matters that I spoke of earlier, and they may be called new experiences of grace. I only touch on them briefly for the guidance of your soul. For a soul that is pure and moved by grace to engage in this spiritual activity of contemplation may learn more in an hour than could be written in a long book. Next time we meet one of those anchoresses to whom Richard Roll and Walter Hilton wrote, the great anchoress herself, Julian of Norwich. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you join me next time.